speaker uh, today is Mr. Ramu Ramaswamy, who is an expert in non-contentious energy law and is currently part of the Oversheds oil and gas team in Paris. He advises Chinese and Indian national oil companies for their upstream investments in Africa and South America and has extensively advised on the development of large-scale LNG projects in the Middle East, Europe, Asia and Australia. Uh, Ramu has previously worked for Total, Freshfields, Rockhouse, Deringer, and Norton Rose. His talk is entitled Offshore Drilling, Regulatory and Contractual Issues. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you very much uh, for giving me the opportunity to make this presentation before you. It's an honor to be here, and uh, I hope uh, I'll be able to may talk to you about something that you find interesting. Uh, it, is, it is an hour before lunch, and, and if, if I like it, when I was at university, an hour before lunch was a battle against sleep and hunger, and I hope... <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, I hope this is uh, a little better. Bar. And um, I'll also try to make this very quick, as quick as possible without uh, uh, cutting short too much of what I was going to say. Uh, I was going to talk about two things. Uh, essentially, the, what the contractual matrix that you will see uh, in an oil, ga oil and gas project that would, that would come or be developed in Lebanon and also quickly look at the appropriate regulatory structure that, uh, that, is, that is sort of appropriate. I understand that uh, there has the, the regulatory process is in, in, in force or in, in uh, development, but there are certain issues that probably they should be looking at given developments in other parts of the world. So, now, if you look at the uh, sort of contractual framework, um, it's a sort of simplified design, but essentially this is what you're looking at. You're looking at <clears throat> a contract between the government and uh, the, the parties, which is the, the international oil company. Usually the international oil companies form consortia because they uh, like to have shared risk. And the, these oil companies have different service providers and have service contracts uh, with them. And as part of the, and, uh, and Lebanon has chosen the production sharing contract uh, method, there's obviously, they could have gone the license way like the UK or some other countries. Um, and each of the parties has a right to product and that product they sell to buyers. So that is the sort of structure of um, an oil and gas project, and that, which is what you'll see in Lebanon. Um, now, again, I'm not going to go into too much detail I, because we don't have the time, but the Lebanese parliament has made a decision and made, a, in my opinion, a wise decision in choosing to go uh, the production, on the, way, the sort of option of taking the production sharing contract. They had an opportunity or an option of doing the buyback contract, which uh, other countries have done, but those are, uh, I mean, are looked on as uh, less uh, attractive to investors. So when a country is trying to attract investment in exploration, it's probably the appropriate choice. Um, now, with respect to, I'm skipping over that. Now, the production sharing agreements for, um, with the model one that I understand has been uh, formulated by the government. Um, the important thing, as was pointed out by uh, the distinguished speaker before me, that there is essentially a division of the right. The oil company makes the investment and has a right to recover its costs, and, and any petroleum that remains after that is shared in accordance with uh, uh, the agreed proportions in the contract. Now, uh, what the, the important uh, questions are, what is that profit share? It has to be a profit share that's attractive, and it's obviously uh, often divide, designed or determined by bidding. 
Uh, the other thing is cost recovery, the principles of how, how you uh, sort of tailor the cost, cost recovery process to make it attractive for people. And finally, uh, the issue of stabilization. When you know, you're spending a lot of money, uh, oil companies like to know that it, what they sort of bid on is what they're going to have 20 years uh, down the line. Um, again, amongst, like, we, like I pointed out, you have amongst the international oil companies that actually are the, develop the project, you have uh, something called a joint operating agreement, which is uh, the sort of agreement between the parties as to how uh, they will develop the project. The important thing to understand about this is that it creates an unincorporated joint venture like a company, but it's not an incorporated company. And unlike other partnerships, the party that's called is the operator has near dictatorial powers. And this is again something that it's important to understand is that you're actually, it's important to make sure that the operator that you have is somebody who will be able to do the project. Um, then we, uh, we also pointed out below the uh, operating agreement is the service contracts. You have various uh, uh, service providers that provide the service to these oil companies. You have uh, geotechnical services or drilling or various other things. I'm going to quickly be talking about drilling contracts because that is probably the, the first type of contracts that you're going to be seeing here. Um, lastly, the a product that is that each of the parties in the uh, joint venture are entitled to are sold by various agreements. What you're probably going to see here in in Lebanon is gas, and therefore you have um, there are fairly specialized sort of animals. You have because of the huge investments that are uh, in required and the lack of a uh, liquid market, you have. Provision are called take or pay provisions, which essentially requires the buyer to take a certain amount of gas or pay for if not taken. Uh, the idea is that it secures uh, revenue to the producer, and that is a sort of um, uh, liability that somebody who is buying gas will have to take. And it's also important to note that because it is not a liquid market, you have uh, the price, determining the price is a very complex sort of process. You have a formula that's usually oil linked and uh, has uh, various uh, for kick points to changing the slope uh, at different, in other words, there is no fixed price. It's a price that moves depending on the market. Uh, <coughs> there are this, the whole project actually has other agreements. I won't be talking about those. Uh, essentially, just to point out that the agreements we talked about aren't really the, uh, the uh, oh, sole basis, but there are other agreements around the, uh, the main agreements we talked about. Now on the, uh, the sort of drilling contracts, which is the, it's actually currently uh, uh, sort of uh, the fashionable now to talk about it. Before it was a service contract that nobody ever talked about, but now because of the incident in, in the Gulf of Mexico, it's become um, a sort of very important uh, contract and people, especially oil companies and oil field service providers are all looking at it very, very closely. I won't sort of deal with the rest of the uh, I mean, I was going to sort of talk about each of these things, but I don't think we have the time. Um, Right. Uh, I'll quickly go to what is the, the sort of liability regime, uh, which is now is actually sort of going, uh, going, undergoing change right now. Uh, essentially, what the liability regime does is to share the risk of an incident between um, a contractor and uh, the oil company, which is the operator. The general principle in the sort of oil and gas business is what we call knock for knock, which essentially means that the person who uh, suffers the loss keeps the loss, but there are certain exceptions. Now, with respect to in drilling contracts, the uh, liability regime is relatively simple. Uh, if there's anything that happens above, any, above the surface of the water, it is the responsibility of the operate, of the of the contractor, and anything below the surface of the water is uh, the responsibility 
of the operator, in other words, the international oil company. Now, there is this whole notion of, which is now developing, um, is a notion of uh, what we call gross negligence. And I mean, if, if the, one of the parties that involved, who are either above or, or the, the operator or the contractor, has indulged in what you could call uh, gross negligence, which is a, a defined term, um, then all bets are off and then the law will take its course. Um, and that's where we are now. We need to look at some of the sort of international conventions that would apply. Uh, international conventions, bizarrely, for, even though offshore developments have been now for maybe 30 years, there's no specific convention that deals with international oil development. You have several conventions uh, that deal with pollution and we deal with, and they have sort of separate provisions and you have to look for all these provisions in different conventions and they have uh, effects on these, uh, on offshore developments. The most important one of this uh, is the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea. Essentially that's where all sovereign rights of countries come from. Uh, it basically sets out, it's an agreement that sets out the rights of coastal states and simply put it gives uh, different rights depending on the distance of the development from the, the coast. Um, and so uh, a country has uh, the right and in fact the obligation to regulate activities uh, anywhere between, between 12 or even the, the land mass and 200 uh, nautical miles into the sea, which is the exclusive economic zone. And so they have the right to exploit the petroleum in that 200 kilometer zone and the obligation to regulate that uh, development. Now, um, the, it is again very important in the, in the Mediterranean uh, uh, region uh, to talk about the the environmental protection because regardless of what sort of uh, developments take place there is uh, there is going to be because of it's a small or relatively small uh, sea mass uh, effects on different countries so if there were developments in Cyprus uh, and there's a problem it certainly would impact on uh, uh, Lebanon and vice versa and it's a it's an issue that all countries in the Mediterranean should be concerned about um, there is, there was the Mediterranean Action Plan, which um, which sort of deals with coastal uh, environmental obligations in the Mediterranean zone. But in my view, it's probably completely inappropriate because it was uh, developed for a time when we were talking about uh, uh, you know tourist resorts on coasts rather than uh, oil and gas uh, development. And so uh, there has to be some sort of um, concern about developing a regime that will deal with uh, uh, the, the new reality as it were. Um, there's several things that uh, uh, you know a country could do. One, you know, we start sort of deal with uh, neighboring countries and develop uh, a co common action plan which is probably the easiest thing to do or look for a large uh, inter-regional development which is uh, something that would be possibly the most appropriate. Um, also we also need to look at um, uh, the international conventions that deal with oil pollution liability. Uh, this is fairly important because this uh, actually sets out, provides an important framework uh, for liability and uh, uh, also uh, indemnization of uh, different parties. Uh, I'm, not, uh, I'm not sure that Lebanon is actually party to the 1992 convention. It's party to the previous convention that sets out uh, the, the liability and one of the things that Lebanon could consider is becoming party to the 1992 convention. Um, now, under the OPRC, Lebanon has become party to the OPRC. Uh, now, I'm not, I haven't actually seen or been aware of uh, the sort of measures that Lebanon has taken, but that's something that they should probably start considering doing. 
uh, and possibly in cooperation with Cyprus that, uh, because it is an area that they would probably cooperate with. Um, now, i also quickly talk about um, regulation. Um, I won't go into the sort of uh, details, but I think it's fairly important for um, Lebanon to sort of uh, consider some regulations now because they've got the Petroleum Authority in place. I think the most important thing is that uh, it's the precautionary principle that's important. So uh, you need to have standards, prescriptive standards that, and usually the best thing is to do is to refer to existing standards. Enshrine clearly the polluter pays principle. And the last one, which is fairly important, and I, I don't actually know whether Lebanon has done it, but is to separate the obligations and the rights of the, uh, between the grantor of the right and the regulator of the right, because both in the US and the UK, it's been found that if uh, a body is in charge of actually granting uh, the petroleum, the right to exploit petroleum, they're not an effective regulator. Um, and so uh, that's something that uh, uh, Lebanon should think about. And so I think, uh, I think I finished in time. So questions? <laughs> Can I have one question? Please. I, that's, what's, that's, what, that's what people in the US and the UK are now saying after the uh, Deepwater Horizon incident. In other words, they found that people who were granting the rights were, not, were too friendly with, with, the, uh, with the petroleum companies to be able to effectively regulate them. So I think the answer would be, I mean, I, I'm, I don't actually know I mean, how, how it would be structured in Lebanon, but uh, they should certainly be distinct in the sense that people who are granting the rights should uh, ideally not have anything to do with people who are actually uh, regulating uh, the oil companies. No, no, no. I don't think it makes any difference for investment. It's just, it's the interest of the country. Uh, I think we, for as far as investment is concerned, if the, if the rules are clear, that should be enough. Thank you, Ramu. Thank you very much.